Colonel? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Washington? May I ask your advice? About a delicate subject. I'm desperately in love. But I don't know how to approach him. How did the two of you first meet? I can't say exactly when we met for the first time. Well, I can't really say. We knew of one another for years. But the time that really matters is when we were reacquainted in March of 1758. We certainly were not anticipating it. I was soldiering at the time, had been for several years. The war against the French was not going well, and I was incredibly sick, almost to the point of death. I had been widowed the year prior, in July of 1757. My husband of seven years, Daniel Park Custis, passed away after a very brief illness that left me the administratrix of the entire Custis estate with two small children to raise on my own. The weight of watching hundreds killed, wounded, and driven from their homes had finally taken a toll, not only on my mind, but my body, and I collapsed under that weight. I was responsible for everything. Every decision, every letter, everything had to come from my pen, a duty I did not take lightly. I spent the next six months teetering between life and death, and had a great deal of time to think about my future and what I wanted. I had no intention of re-entering society. I was quite content being alone with my children. It was not the life I had envisioned living, but it was what the divine providence had given me. In March, I came to Williamsburg to ask Dr. Amson if I was going to live or die. He very kindly told me it was the former rather than the latter. While I was in Williamsburg, a friend of mine, Richard Chamberlain, told me that there was to be a small gathering at his estate and that I had to stop by. Mrs. Chamberlain had written to me asking me to come to her estate. They had been my neighbors in New Kent for many years and we had a lovely time. But that afternoon, every time I tried to leave, she told me I had to wait for Richard to return from Williamsburg. I had no intention of staying. I had no idea Mr. Chamberlain was bringing a guest with him. In fact, uh, I told my man Bishop to keep the horses saddled and waiting outside, as all I expected to do was give my regards and then continue on to Winchester. When Mr. Chamberlain arrived, he escorted into the room a tall, handsome, blushing up to his eyebrows and very embarrassed Colonel Washington. But there was Mrs. Custis, a lady of infinite quality and far beyond my social station. I had not seen the Colonel in years. I had not seen her in years. And there was a rumor going around Williamsburg that he had died, so to see him in person was quite the shock. I had heard that someone else was passionately pursuing her at the time. Who? I won't say his name, but, but I had no hopes of our conversation being any more than pleasantries. And it was love at first? Well, second sight? It was not so simple as that. As we spoke, I realized that she was the first person to listen to me and see beyond my position as a soldier and the weight of societal expectations that had fallen upon me. He was the first person since my husband passed away that saw me for... Me? He wasn't interested in the size of my estate or what being attached to a Custis could bring him. She was kind. He was kind. She asked questions that took me aback. She asked me how the war had affected me. He asked about my children, their names, their ages, what they liked, what they didn't like. She saw me for me, something that I hadn't experienced in quite a long time. So many gentlemen were so eager to tell me what I should be doing with my children, with the estate, with my people. Colonel Washington was the first person to ask me what I wanted. When did you know you wished to marry one another? Well, that first night in March, we spoke for entirely too long. <laughs> 
poor bishop was outside with the horses for hours. Eventually I remembered and dismissed him for the night, and he still has not forgiven me. At the end of the evening, I told Colonel Washington that when next he was in the area, that he might come by my estate, the White House, so that we could continue our conversation. I didn't expect to see him for months. I was back in two weeks. That started a lovely spring and early summer of meeting when we could. Continuing that conversation that started at the Chamberlain's. We talked about everything. I felt like I could be myself. Eventually, we realized that we preferred to be in one another's company above all others. It was a simple decision, really. We both were seeking a partner, and we found it. In each other. But I still had other responsibilities, namely the Forbes expedition. He was away for nine months. I was still a soldier, and I had to finish what I started. But we kept in touch during his absence, through pen and ink. It was a comfort to me. It was a comfort to me. We took Fort Duquesne from the French in November 1758, buried our comrades that had died at Monongahela three years prior. I came back to Williamsburg to resign my commission and went straight to her house. He arrived on Christmas Eve. It was snowing. We had been expecting him much sooner. My carriage axle broke on the way. My sweet Jackie tried to stay up to greet him, but fell fast asleep before he arrived. My little Patsy and I were there to greet him. And two weeks later, we were married. On Twelfth Night. January 6th, 1759. It was the perfect time to be married for us. Twelfth Night. The end of the Christmas tide season is a time for new starts, renewed hope, fresh beginnings. All of those things both the Colonel and I were searching for, and we found them together.